or an independent contractor or operate a small business, I'm confident that you will find today's conversation incredibly helpful. We are humbled to have assembled an esteemed panel of experts, including Sanaz Jahangad. Sanaz is a business attorney with Brown, Streza, and Irvine, California. She frequently represents clients in mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, income tax planning, and real estate transactions. Sanaz often works closely with other attorneys and advisors, such as accountants, valuation experts, and financial planners and bankers to provide comprehensive services that benefit her clients. Sanaz is also the president of the Iranian American Bar Association's Orange County chapter and supports the IABA's commitments to informing and educating the Iranian community, as well as local representatives and the public at large about legal issues of interest and concerning to the Iranian American community. The panel also includes Fayyan Ghazrafi. After earning her MBA in Human Resources Management from the University of North Texas, Fayyan obtained her law degree from the Southern Methodist University where she graduated cum laude. She practiced labor and employment law representing employers at several international law firms for 15 years before accepting an opportunity in Southern California to go in-house and serve as Assistant General Counsel of Employment for one of the nation's leading healthcare systems operating over 45 hospitals in 14 states. Farin has also taught as an adjunct professor of law at Chapman University, Fowler School of Law, a private university in Orange, California. Earlier this year, Farin joined Claris HR as a human resources consultant serving employers in California and Texas by addressing the most complex human capital and employment law compliance issues. Our panel also includes Chris Saki. Chris is a tax attorney with Tories, one of the leading Canada US growth sprouter business law firms in North America. Chris works in Tories New York office where he advises clients on tax aspects of mergers, acquisitions, reorganizations, and investments. Chris also holds an MBA and has a background in financial planning. He's a certified financial planner and a CPA and assists community legal services groups for providing pro bono estate planning services and benefits assistance for military veterans in addition to his law practice. We're excited to have Lada Monterey, who is a chair of our board of directors, moderate tonight's panel. Laudan is a champion of social good with business results. Currently, she is a senior advisor to Georgetown University's Business for Impact Initiative and also operates a private consulting practice. Her experience spans startup and well-established organizations. Before joining Georgetown University, Monterey's executive roles include partner networks at Social Progress Imperative, AARP, and PowerUp. In public service, she has served on various political campaigns and held positions in the United States government agencies, including working for President Bill Clinton and Vice President Al Gore in the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Laudan has served on countless boards and holds a BA in political science from the University of California in Davis. If you have questions for our panel today, please use the question answer box to submit those. And please note that the information today is not meant to be taken as legal or tax advice. We ask that you consult professionals for those specific inquiries. With that said, I will turn it over to Lada. Thank you, Hamid. That was a great introduction of all our panelists and I'm thrilled to have all of you with us. Thank you to our participants who are viewing as well. Um, let me first say as chair of the NIAC board how um, honored we are to have as our partner for this program the Iranian American Bar Association. The collaboration and partnership continues throughout the years and going forward and it's really a, a valuable one for the community overall. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for your support of NIAC as we launch into our next iteration and dealing with the issues of the impacts of corona here at home in the US um, really affect our community, particularly our business owners, as well as all of us as employees as well. Um, and we're all taxpayers too. So from various aspects, we're all feeling this. We're all feeling this. So Sanas, I'm gonna ask you first and foremost, you know, when the PPP first came out, 
um, everybody thought it was free money. So a lot of people started jumping on it. Then there was some press that came out in terms of these loans really getting accessed by companies that seemed you know, questionable as to whether or not they should get them, some large chains and otherwise. And then the money was gone. Then another tranche was let out. So things started to shift. First question, I keep hearing this still now, is there PPP money still available? Yes, there is. So first of all, I wanted to thank uh, NIAC for collaborating with the Iranian American Bar Association on this valuable program. And thank you so much for having me as part of uh, the panel here. Um, yes, there is. This is really good news. Uh, the previous application cycle ended end of June, June 30th. And then uh, on Monday, we received news that a new application cycle opened and it is open now, and it closes August 8th. So if you are a borrower who didn't get enough money, and I'll go into detail a little bit about that, or have not applied because you believe there is just not enough money, or you were in the application process, but your application was not actually received by the SBA and wasn't fully uh, processed, then go ahead and contact your banker, your SBA lender, and apply as soon as possible. Um, some of our clients, what happened was they are self-employed with employees, but what they didn't do when they originally applied for the PPP loan, they did not include their own payroll in the amount that they could borrow. So if you uh, are one of those applicants who only borrowed money to cover payroll other than your own, you can go ahead and apply for additional funds. Just keep in mind that you still have to meet the uh, calculation in the act, which is two and a half months of payroll, but you can go ahead and include your own payroll. So that is good news and there is still money left to go ahead and send in your applications as soon as possible. That's terrific news. I think a lot of people are, are thrilled to hear that aspect of it. And just kind of going into this, since this is the third tranche of funding that's being made available uh, in PPP, are there any differences? Are there any nuances being introduced into this next tranche in terms of who can access or some more scrutiny being applied that people should be considering if they're trying to go back and get some funding? Yeah, actually, uh the, there was a flexibility um, act issued just recently on June 5 that amended the original CARES Act with respect to the PPP loan. And um, the flexibility act actually provided, as it says, some flexibilities that are useful to business owners. Um, and I'm gonna just briefly go over some of them. Uh, one of the mo uh, main and most important points is that Previously, a borrower only had eight weeks from the date they received the loan proceeds to spend the money. And they had to spend 75% of the funds on payroll costs and the balance on specific non-payroll costs. So now what the Flexibility Act said is you have 24 weeks to spend the money. That's 168 days. And um, that applies to all borrowers who receive their loan proceeds after June 5. If you were part of those borrowers who received their loan proceeds prior to June 5, you can elect to either use your eight week period as you had previously calculated, or you can use the 24 week period. So you have that option. The only thing is that you have to have spent all of the proceeds prior to applying for loan forgiveness. The other good news is instead of having to spend 75% of the loan proceeds on payroll costs, now you have to only spend 60% on payroll costs and you get 40% to spend on non-payroll costs. And we can cover what those are a little bit down the line if we have time. The other good news was the Flexibility Act extended the maturity date of the loan or the portion of the loan that is not forgiven from two years to five years. And again, this applies, uh, the five year applies to borrowers who receive their proceeds after June 5. If you're a borrower who received the loan proceeds prior to June 5, 
you can mutually agree with your banker to extend that um, period to five years. So that's not automatic. Please go ahead and reach out to your lender if there is going to be a non-forgivable amount so you can extend that um, repayment period to five years. Your lender will automatically calculate how much you owe, how much is not forgiven um, with the help of your PPP application. And they have to let you know when your first payment due date is, if there is a payment due, if any portion of the loan is not forgiven. Um, the other piece- I'm sorry, really quick. When yeah. does the clock start? When does the clock start for the eight weeks or 24 weeks? So that, that was one of the changes too. So previously the clock started the date you received your first disbursement from the lender. Now it has changed. Um, so it's that first date of disbursement of loan still applies. So that's option one. Mm -hmm. And then for all employers who have bi-weekly, meaning every other week, or more frequent payroll schedules. So if you're paying your employees weekly or every other week, you have the option, instead of using the first date that you receive your loan disbursement, you can use the first day of your payroll. Meaning, let's say you're a borrower and you receive your funds on June 10th and your first payroll is scheduled for June 15th. You can either start your 24 week clock running from June 10th, or you can start the clock running from June 15th, which is the first date that your payroll is due. So that is when the ACH processes the payroll, if you have direct deposit, or if you're working with a payroll provider, um, such as ADP or Paychex, and that's the date they process the check or the day that you actually disperse checks to your employees, that you can use that date. So that extends your 168 days a little bit. But that again only applies if you have a biweekly or every other week uh, payroll. And if you receive the money with the eight week uh, process in place, but now want to use it for 24 weeks, do you have to take any kind of measure or step to indicate that you want to use it over 24 weeks instead of the eight weeks? Or is that just automatic? No, you can, you, you can elect that. You do not have to notify anyone. You do the calculations on your uh, application. So with the Flexibility Act, actually two new applications were issued. One is a long form, and one is an easy form. And there is a worksheet attached to the application that allows you to calculate. And we highly recommend that you work with your attorney or with your CPA or accountant to exactly calculate, to fill out the, uh, the worksheet. The new applications actually made it, the forgiveness applications made it easier to calculate, but you, you elect there that you have the 168 days that you would like to use. You do not have to submit a separate form uh, to the uh, SBA at this point. Great. So I'm going to come back to you in a, in a minute around forgiveness, because I think a lot of people who've already applied or are considering it uh, are really wondering about the forgiveness piece. But since you hit on taxes, this is a key point. Um, Chris, we've got a week left before the extended deadline now, the new deadline to pay taxes. And to Sun this point, I mean, there, there are some varied implications around you know, how PPP should be factored into calculating taxes, what you should declare, et cetera. What are some of the nuances that folks who have taken these loans should be mindful of as they are about to file their taxes for 2019? Uh, yeah, so um, there's actually a couple uh, technical aspects of that. So, uh, so right now it's not entirely certain whether business expenses uh, that you pay with the proceeds from a PPP loan uh, are still deductible like they normally would be, uh, or you know, if they're not deductible once you use uh, PPP loan money to pay them. Uh, so that's definitely something uh, that every business owner would want to, you know, you'd want to consult with your uh, accountant slash bookkeeper slash, you know, whoever. Uh, you're using to uh, submit your taxes, uh, you know, for each person's individual situation. Um, another important thing to point out is that uh, while the P 
PPP loan is uh, sort of uh, the most uh, visible sort of emergency loan vehicle right now. There are other SBA loans uh, that some business owners uh, can apply for and receive, but it's important to remember that the PPP loan actually has hardwired into it a provision where if that loan is forgiven, now normally under general tax principles, when you have debt canceled, the IRS views that as taxable income. So, you know, for example, if, if you have like a student loan and you owe $100,000 uh, and through whatever program that loan goes away, you would actually be viewed as if you had made $100,000 of income that year and then would pay tax on it. So with the PPP loan, it's actually uh, written into the law that uh, if the PPP loan is forgiven, that that is not uh, debt cancellation income. However, uh, not all of the other types of emergency loans available from the SBA uh, have that protection built in. So that's definitely something to, to consider if anyone is you know, looking at those other loans also. Sorry, the mute had a mind of its own. I guess it wanted to keep me muted and keep you talking for a bit. Um, I think you know the these nuances uh, are a little you know um, there's so many pieces to it, and I want to go back to Sonos for a minute. On you know you you mentioned Christopher the you know the the forgiveness factor too, you know. Sonos, what is what's important to keep in mind right now in terms of forgiveness? And you know, what how are how is uh, how is the government actually thinking about what is eligible for forgiveness? Because I think this is important as we think about the tax considerations and other HR considerations too, because you know, once you get this loan. You know, some of the conditions are that you got to keep your employees on and then what happens if okay the money's done and you're in, you're still struggling and now you're thinking about laying people off you know what are some of those key things to keep in mind about forgiveness that's a very good question Aran John so a few things to keep in mind is generally speaking um, first of all it is not an automatic forgiveness. You must absolutely apply for it. Wait until the funds are used and then apply for it. Thirdly, make sure you use the proceeds for the forgivable purposes. 60% are payroll costs, and that includes all cash compensation, all uh, commissions, all um, bonuses, vacation pay, it includes uh, cash tips if you're specifically in the service industry. It includes uh, payments for um, health and group health insurance premiums. And um, it includes your um, state taxes, not the FICA, but the state taxes. So there is a, a vast number that you can include in your payroll costs. If you have to terminate an employee for cause, and if you are paying them separation pay, that's included. If you are uh, unable to work remotely and you have people come actually into the office, into your place of business to work, you can pay them hazard pay. You can pay them bonus pay. All that can be included, including your own compensation as a business owner can be included in the payroll costs. And then for non-payroll costs, it's the business mortgage interest, um, and make sure you get that amortization from your lender. It's the business utilities that you had already in place before February 15th. Um, the business mortgage interest also for a loan you had in place before February 15th. For your utilities, business utilities that for services you already had in place. Lease that you had already in place before February 15th. Keep record of that. What we have generally recommended to our clients is if you can't set up a separate business account and get all your loan proceeds from the PPP loan into that account, or if you're also um, applying for the idle loan, 
get those loan proceeds into a separate business account and keep track of this spending. Work directly with your accountant, with your bookkeeper, CFO, and um, make sure you keep proper tracking of this. The loan forgiveness application, take a look at it quickly. Um, even before you have spent on the money, look at the worksheet and start plugging in numbers. Start keeping track of the documents that you need to submit, uh, which are all documents substantiating your um, forgiveness amount. So keep those and submit those, the ones that are required. If we have time, we can go over what is required to be submitted and what is required to be maintained. And another thing is, if you have to uh, terminate an employee for cause, or if you try to rehire a former employee in writing and they decided not to come back, or if you have to reduce their hours because your business activity is just not the same as it was before February 15, that is fine. Those are exemptions and safe harbors that were issued under the original CARES Act, as well as the Flexibility Act. You just have to keep proper documentation showing that you actually made the offer to a newly qualified employee or to your former employee and they refuse to come back, showing that you offered to give them the same wages but they wanted to reduce the hours, showing that your business is just not doing well enough due to the COVID regulations, requirements, and guidelines issued um, by the CDC, OSHA, or your state and local government. Keep all those documentations so you can take advantage of the exemptions that are available to you so that you can maximize your loan forgiveness amount. Yeah, that, uh, those, are, um, those are some key points. I think this cusp of trying to bring people back to work as well and trying to get back into, you know, introduction of some normalization is, is really on the minds of a lot of people, both as employees mm -hmm. and as employers. And you have, you know, this, this roller coaster of COVID cases also factoring in affecting work. So fine, let me ask you a question. You know, when employers are thinking about reopening, when employees are thinking about going back to work, what do you do if you do have an at-risk employee? What do you do if you have somebody who may be 62 years old, great worker, wants to come back, but is a little reticent about coming back because he's high risk? What do you do if you have somebody who is five months pregnant and you know is a frontline worker and doesn't necessarily have the option of working remotely? What are some of these considerations that employers are thinking about from an HR vantage point? Great question, Lauden. And we've been grappling since, I suppose, mid-March when um, we had all these quarantine orders, shutdown orders, and various orders regarding what's considered essential business, what's not. The main thing that was happening um, initially, we noticed, was when the CDC said, look, we have a vulnerable population. If you have diabetes, if you're pregnant, if you're above 65, you are at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19. We have some very responsible and benevolent employers who were trying to protect those employers, employees by saying, pregnant employee, you may not come to the workplace because we're really concerned about you. So initially, it was all out of the goodness of our hearts, right? As employers trying to take care of our employees, employers were setting up rules by saying, work from home, we're going to have other employees come to the office. The EEOC got wind of this and they said, no, 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 no. No matter how benevolent your intentions are, you still are obligated to treat all employees the same. Meaning what? Meaning we understand you're concerned about your pregnant employee. We know you're concerned about your above 65 employee. But if you start treating them differently because you're concerned, out of a, the motive is fine. You're concerned about them contracting COVID. So you're saying, please don't come back to the office. You're actually discriminating based on their pregnancy status or based on age, which are both of them, as we know, under Title VII, you may not discriminate or treat employees differently based on that. The other issue became, so what do we do? And one of the, one of the ways that we've been trying to We've been experimenting, it's, it's been working is, if you're trying to implement a work from home policy, for example, don't pinpoint and point at your diabetic 
employees or employee that you know might have kidney issues or the pregnant employee or the older employee ask for volunteers so we do have a telecommuting policy we do we're trying to bring part of our workforce back but we don't have to bring 100 percent of our employees back who's going to who which one of you wants to volunteer and work from home and let them raise their hand and say i want to work from home which typically is not you know hard to accomplish right now so many of our employees are fearing that they might contract COVID and are reluctant about going back. So that's one way of handling that by having your employees choose whether or not they want to come back. Now, the other, the flip side of the coin is we have all these employees that say, I don't want to come back. And the EEOC has been clear on this. The Department of Labor in California has been clear on this. And nationally, many states have said the same thing. Unless there is a real threat of safety, just saying, I'm concerned about coming back to work, I'm not coming back to work because I'm worried about contracting COVID is not a valid reason to accommodate unless the employee says, look, my kidney is functioning at 40%, I have a doctor's note, and you go through the regular Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA interactive process of figuring out how to accommodate, a general fear itself is not protected. So at that point, it would be a conversation, look, employee who's afraid to come back to work, we have, we're following CDC guidelines. We have all these protocols in place and you show them that you have set in place procedures per CDC mandate. And some states actually have, some counties, some states have their own regulations. We are providing a safe workplace. And so at that point, if they refuse to come back to work, you may sever that relationship. So it's cutting both ways. Folks who don't wanna come back to work and employers treating some employees who are in the vulnerable population differently out of the goodness of their heart. Uh, just a, a slight nuance to this. What if there's a case where you have an employee who is saying, uh, you know what, I'm waiting for my test results. And, you know, we know that there are backups all over the country to get the results back from the labs. What happens in that kind of situation? Absolutely. So we're facing that too. And Hopefully, most of our business owners who are under 500 employees are aware of the FECRA. That's the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. It was passed in March. It went into effect April 1. Every employer, again, this applies to employers who have fewer than 500 employees. They were required to have these posters in the workplace. If they had folks telecommuting, they were supposed to email it to them to tell them about certain leave laws that were passed because of COVID. So employees waiting on their test results, and as an employer, we are requiring that because the individual either became exposed or um, they were in a situation where they were experiment experiencing symptoms, and so they're waiting on their test results. If they're not able to come back to work because of some sort of a governmental body saying you must quarantine or wait until you get your test results back, which is frankly the CDC at this point. The CDC has certain right. guidelines saying if you're asymptomatic but you took a test, this is what you have to do in order to go back to work, etc. Then hopefully our employers are following those mandates under FECRA. We have but the can emergency. Be paid? Can yes. the so, be so paid? You got it. So um, if it's because of a mandate by a governmental body, which generally the answer would be yes, that's why we're waiting on a test then they should be paid under FECRA, either under the emergency under the emergency paid sick leave, which is about 80 hours. So it comes out to what, 10, 10, 10 days. But good news for employers is this is all tax credit. There is a cap. Um, there is a $2,000 in total cap for pay. Um, so it comes in handy for lower paid employees, but um, hopefully folks are aware of that and they're following that protocol okay. under FECRA. Great, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna go to Chris for a second, but before I do, just a reminder to our audience, if you do have questions, please go ahead and start submitting them. We wanna weave this into a conversation and, uh, and definitely take your questions into consideration. We've got a little bit more time left, so please uh, don't wait until we prompt you later on. Chris, let me ask, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about some of these tax considerations. As we are, um, as you know, as employers and as business owners looking to bring back employees as well, you know, what from a tax standpoint do you think is important for a business owner, um, you know, a, a consultant, a sole proprietor, 
uh, to keep in mind as they're going into this end of this tax season, but also thinking about 2020 and next year having to file their taxes. What are the kind of the two or three most critical factors they should be thinking about? Okay, so I would say, well, just to uh, uh, follow up uh, on Farron's, uh, you know, talking about the uh, reemployment situation. So, so there are two particular tax provisions under the CARES Act uh, that are uh, significantly impacted by a business's employment situation. Uh, so there is a payroll tax deferral, and there's also a payroll tax credit. Uh, which is also referred to as the employee retention tax credit, uh, which some of you may have heard of. So uh, these can easily be, be confused, but but they're very different. So I'm going to talk about the payroll tax credit first. Uh, so for that, it's uh, basically from March to December of this year. Uh, as many of you know, you know, for employers, you have to pay 12.8%. Uh, uh, employer tax on wages, uh, I'm sorry, 6.2% employer tax on uh, wages, and then the uh, employee pays their 6.2% share of its uh, social security tax. So what the provision in the CARES Act does is it gives you a $5,000 credit, uh, or more technically, it's it's 50% of up to $10,000 of wages. So if you have an employee that up to this point, you have paid them $10,000, that 50% of that, you can get that credited. And so basically it allows you to, you know, if you look at the, uh, the employee tax account that you have to deposit money into, you know, whether it's uh, monthly or uh, semi-weekly or whatever your schedule is, uh, if you look at the account and the deposits you've made for your employer share of employment taxes, and if when you apply the 50% credit, there is extra money in there, you can actually file a form with the IRS, a new form, uh, 7200, and you can get the excess refunded back to you. So that actually allows you some sort of you know immediate emergency cash flow uh, for certain employers who are in that particular situation where they have an overfunding of their employer tax account with the IRS uh, because of this credit. Uh, the trick is that this credit might actually be very difficult to utilize in practice uh, because there are a lot of technical requirements. Uh, the first set of requirements has to do with an employer. So in order for an employer to be eligible, uh, they must have been closed due to a governmental order or, you know, uh, reduced hours from normal due to a governmental order. Uh, and if that's not the situation, they could still qualify, but they would have to be able to document uh, that their quarterly, uh, their quarterly earnings for this quarter are less than half what they were for the same quarter last year. So it has to be a, a significant impact to business operations in order for you to be an eligible employer uh, and qualify for that. And then once you cross that hurdle, then there's a question of whether the wages are eligible. And then this depends on, you know, there's certain limitations. If you have more than 100 employees, uh, it's a little bit easier if you have less than 100 employees. Uh, but the key thing with the current crisis is that if you have any employees that are getting emergency paid sick leave uh, or family leave. And if you apply for the credits that are attached to those benefits, you then cannot use those wages to calculate your benefit under the payroll tax credit. So it becomes very tricky. It, it almost seems like it's, it's sort of like the credit of last resort for people who uh, either have used up all the other benefits and still have other wage expenses, right, that haven't been offset by any of the other benefits, uh, or if for whatever reason they didn't qualify for any of the other benefits, but, uh, you know, for their specific situation, they do qualify for the, the tax credit. And um, the last thing I want to note on the tax credit is that if you receive a PPP loan, you don't qualify. So that's sort of the biggest right there. 
Wait a minute, um, you buried the lead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, uh, I, I wanted to uh, sort of differentiate that from the other thing, which is the payroll tax deferral. So this is not so hard, not as hard to qualify for. Um, so what the payroll tax deferral is, is uh, basically your, your 50% of, uh, sorry, your, your 6.2% social security employer share that you are depositing with the IRS, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether quarterly or monthly or semi-weekly, uh, for wages paid starting from the end of March to December of this year, uh, you can actually defer payment on half of that. So whatever your, your monthly, you know, sort of tax uh, cost is, if you're, you know, if you're depositing $5,000 normally into your employer tax account with the IRS, you can automatically defer 50% of that amount. And the, uh, the deferral is uh, you would have to pay whatever you defer. The first half of it isn't due until December 31st, 2021. And then the second half of it isn't due until December 31st, 2022. So you're essentially getting uh, a two-year loan on sort of a on another quarter of the tax cost. Uh, and if you do receive a PPP loan, you are still eligible to exercise the deferral. However, if the loan is forgiven, then you're no longer eligible. So it's, uh, it's right now an open question and uh, you know, practitioners are awaiting further guidance from the IRS right. on you know, what does a business owner do if they get a PPP loan and either they weren't planning on having it forgiven or it just, you know, they weren't thinking about it. And so they start taking the, uh, the employee, the social security tax, employer tax deferrals, and then they end up getting the loan forgiven. It's sort of an open question of, so do you, is the deferral due immediately? Is, you know, do I have to repay the forgiveness? What, what happens? Because there's clearly a double dip there, but it's, there's no uh, clear guidance right now on, you know, on what you're supposed to do if you inadvertently do that. What happens if you don't get the PPP, but you get an EIDL? How does that apply? Uh, so the payroll tax deferral is, I don't think that's, you would definitely want to uh, consult with, you know, your, your accountant or bookkeeper if you have, you know, those sorts of specific situations because uh, the, yeah, the requirements for both the credit and the deferral, uh, very technical uh, and yeah, subject to a lot of, of nuance. Okay. All right. Boy, you know, the tax pieces are really making my head spin. And I know there's so many implications and there's so many things that we still don't know yet, right? And rules are going to evolve and change as well. So it seems like, you know, obviously staying close to your tax consultant and conferring now for next year in terms of, you know, what are the best ways to actually, you know, take the next steps around forgiveness, around bringing employees back, around, you know, what pieces, to apply for and not apply for and the different factors, you know, you gotta really be lockstep with your tax consultant as a business owner along the way here. Um, Asanas, I wanna come back to you for a minute around the, the forgiveness. Um, this is just, you know, such a fascinating, uh, you know, opportunity to tap into money. And a lot of people have, Forgiveness, though, is requiring a form. It is not automatic, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So when it comes to, okay, so now I know that I have to take one more step. I have to ask for forgiveness. I have to beg for forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit less than begging this time. It's like, just ask. Um, you know, I've seen the form a little bit. It doesn't seem to be that difficult. But, and you indicated earlier, um, once you've actually used the funds, then you ask, you know, then you go and file for forgiveness. But, you know, where do you go to do that? Where do you find the form? Who do you go to? Do you go to your lender? Mm -hmm. Do you go to the SBA? Where do you go? Okay, very good question. So yes, you absolutely have to apply for forgiveness. It does not happen automatically. Um, the act has 
authorized two new applications and those are available online as well as through your lender. So I would generally suggest if you're looking for the application, you can probably Google it. If you email us, we're happy to send you the link so you can take a look at the um, official application for forgiveness that was recently issued on June 5 and look at the uh, worksheets attached to it so that you're familiar with the form and you can start gathering the information that you need when the time comes to actually formally submit the application. Note that the best uh, possible scenario is to ask your lender if they're using the exact same application that was published or if they're using a similar form but not exactly the form because remember ultimately the application has to go through your lender mm -hmm. so the borrower has to calculate uh, and fill in the application and the borrower makes it certain certifications representing that what the um, loan proceeds were used for exactly the forgivable purposes and the purposes that are authorized for the PPP loan. Because remember, this is not just any kind of a loan that you get and then you can use it or keep the money. Some of our clients ask, well, I have some cash available. Can I keep this money in the bank and use the cash that I have now and then use this money to pay off something else, some other loan I have? Well, look at the application it specifically says at the time you applied for the loan you had to certify you had to represent you will be using the loan for the purposes indicated mm -hmm. now you can go get the idle loan you can go get other loans for other purposes but for this loan and then on the forgiveness application again you are certifying you use the loan for the purposes that it was prescribed for. And it is supposed to be a paycheck protection loan. It's not just a loan to pay off an, a credit card balance that you had on your business account that you cannot pay right now. You can use other loans for that. The idle loan, for example, um, 10,000 of which can be a grant. You can use that for whatever purposes you want. But this PPP loan, you have to be very mindful, look at the five certifications you're making because um, it is up to the borrower to confirm those certifications. That's number one, meaning all of the risk and liability is with the borrower to confirm that all of the five things that they're representing on the applications are true and accurate. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the lender only has a minimal review obligation, meaning they're not going to go and recalculate everything. They're not going to go and verify every single piece of information and keep following up with you. So make sure you do the application as best as you can, provide all the documentation that you can. Mm -hmm. um, once the lender receives your application, you have up to 10 months after your 24 week period or eight week period is over to apply for that loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. but when you apply, then it goes to the lender. The lender goes through a very quick review and submits their decision to the SBA along with the forgiveness application that you provided and along with the documentation that you provided. And then SBA will review the, the decision of the lender. So the lender can come back and say, the loan was, the forgiveness was denied, partial or in whole. And if it's partial, it'll give you a reason why, or it can say it is completely approved, or um, it can say it, it, it is not forgivable at all. So, so then, yeah, go ahead. So I, I was on, a, um, on another conversation with a couple of representatives from the SBA uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And one of the strongest messages that they gave around the forgiveness piece was be sure that your loan application form ha uh, and your forgiveness form match up. Mm -hmm. and that the information that you put on your forgiveness form is the same as that which was on your loan form. Is that correct? Is that what you're hearing too? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because even though loans that are less than $2 million are presumed to have been made in good faith, so the borrower certification is presumed to have been in good faith if you have a loan less than $2 million. If you have over $2 million, it's almost guaranteed that your loan will be audited. Okay. But make sure several things that we hear all the time from our clients. You know, can I use this money for something else? Can I, um, 
pay advance? Can I pay the rent in advance? Can I pay my utility bills in advance? Mm -hmm. Can I prepay an employee? No. Do everything. That's my recommendation. Again, your situation might be different. You want to check with your advisor. You want to check with your attorneys and your SBA lender. But generally speaking, keep things and your operation and your procedures the way you would normally do it. Got it. Um, we re yeah, that's well, really important that you have consistency with your application amount, with what you indicated on your original application and your forgiveness application. Great. Um, one, one quick question uh, that, uh, that's come through by a few folks, and that is, so let's say you're a business owner that has rental properties for other businesses, but mm -hmm. you're not getting the rent. So if you have restaurant owners, you have shop owners that have closed down and they can't afford to pay their rent. Can I, as the owner of those facilities, of those properties, get a PPP loan to pay my mortgages? So that's a very good question. I would say number one is how do you own the interest in those properties? Typically it's either a partnership or an LLC. And then look at is the LLC a single member LLC? Is it filing schedule C? Is it a disregarded entity for tax purposes? Or is it a partnership? which typically if you have multiple members in an LLC, you have probably opted to be taxed as a partnership. And again, check with your CPA on that. So based on what entity you have that owns these properties, that will, and the affiliation rules, if you have multiple entities owning multiple properties or shopping centers or whatever you have, you have to sit down and look through, one, the ownership, two, the affiliation rules. And then you can see there is specific formula, depending on what type of entity you are, what type of taxpayer you are, and how you can calculate your PPP loan amount. Okay. That's the first thing. The second thing to keep in mind, keep in mind, this loan is not for people to be able to um, make up their lost business income, okay? Right. So you can pay business mortgage interest if the loan is under the entity that owns the property and then only the mortgage interest not the actual mortgage uh -huh. keep it this is the payment for payroll okay so you can probably get some money if you pay distributions to yourself your income if you're self-employed for compared to last year but it's not just a way to make up the rents you're not currently getting there might be additional information for that. There might be additional relief for that. Maybe you can talk to your lender and have your um, mortgage deferred or possibly get a forbearance of some sort, um, if, especially if you are not collecting rent from the tenants uh, during the COVID while their businesses are closed. There might be other avenues you can, you can go through in order to get some sort of relief. But keep in mind, if you get the PPP loan, you're certifying that you're using it for the forgivable purposes, 60% right. payroll, 40% non-payroll. And then sit down and, and look at the ownership of the entities, the affiliation rules, and each entity can separately apply. And then you calculate how much you could actually get under the PPP loan to at least get some relief that way. And then you can supplement that with additional relief out there. You know, we've got to do a whole other piece around forgiveness. So let's think about that um, because it, <laughs> there's so many nuances to it. And it is. At the beginning of the conversations around forgiveness. Um, I want to go back to fighting for a second. Fighting, there's been a lot of conversation, especially this week, around schools. Uh, around let's get the kids back to school. So that has implications for parents and actually even being able to go back to work, having kids stay at home, having kids in school, they're all connected. What happens when employees need to leave because they don't have childcare? What happens- Remember how I was talking about the Families First um, response, corona, FECRA, FECRA as we, as we call it. There is a provision in there regarding expanding FMLA leave. Most employers know what Family Medical Leave Act was. However, you could never say, I need FMLA leave because my, I have no childcare. That was never a permissible purpose for leave under the FMLA. 
So the new law that came into effect April 1 says, employers, you must provide leave to those employees whose children's childcare centers and schools have closed. Now, a lot of issues open, it, it opened a can of worm regarding what happens to summer camps, schools now out, we're still under quarantine in some cities, some states, some counties. The Department of Labor back on, I want to say, June 26th or so, came out with a field bulletin advisory because the Department of, Department of Labor investigators are out there and they are fining and penalizing employers who are not complying with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So the field bulletin says, if you had planned or you, have, you had enrolled your child in a summer camp or in some sort of a childcare facility which is no longer available, your employees are entitled to it. And guess what, employers? No, you may not go and say, I need a certified letter from your child care center, from your school, from your camp to show that in fact they have closed. So they've removed that burden. The onus is not really on the employee to prove it. Now, should there be a, be a lawsuit, they should be able to somehow bring forth evidence that says, look, I had registered my son, for example, for a sailing camp last summer. So that's what I was planning on doing again this summer to be able to go to work once schools closed. Because of COVID, not because of summer vacations, because of COVID, that child, that um, summer camp has not closed. So I have no means to take care of my children. So they would be entitled to that 10 weeks which they would get paid at about two thirds of their salary with a cap of 2000, I believe is what it is for childcare issues. And just so you know how, um, how the investigators for the Department of Labor are out there, are taking calls and are investigating. Um, just recently, um, it was an agency in California, they were penalized $3,600 because an employee did qualify for, um, for leave to be able to take care of her child whose school closed due to COVID. Now, we're gonna deal with this like Lada and you said, come August or September, where most of our schools will either say, sorry, you have to do distant learning, or your kids only get to come to school twice a week. According to this field bulletin by the Department of Labor, it's the same analysis. School, those four days, three days, two days, whatever, whatever it be that school's closed, the employee is entitled to a protective leave. Again, it's not that long, folks. It's um, 10 weeks. And there is a cap on the salary for their pay. And as um, Christopher explained, um, some of it is tax credit, now depending on how it's structured, but it, there is a tax credit for it. So yes, they do get that right to be able to take that expanded FMLA leave to provide care for their children. This is going to be an issue. I mean, I think for all employers, large, small, and even as families, this is going to be a big issue because uh, generally the guidelines are starting to come out for school districts and, um, you know, let alone colleges and universities. But for school districts, I think for the most part, it's going to be that um, young children will be going back to school only for two days or three days a week and there will be staggered uh, schedules and therefore that is going to have an implication for work. Um, so, you know, this is, this is affecting everybody. This is affecting everybody, whether you are an employer or you're a parent or you are an employee. There are nuances to all of this. Um, so, you know, I know that there are there's so much more we can dive into on this. It, it is evolving, it is revolving, and I think that it's gonna be important for NIAC and for I, IABA to continue to have um, conversation with our community, to be a resource for our community on these issues at a consistent basis. Um, because it, you know, we all need the insights. We're learning together as we go along. So with that, I want to say thank you so much to our uh, panelists. There are a few questions that did come in through the Q&A, so if I could just ask you all to take a quick look at those and, and try and respond to them if you can, um, directly to those who have asked them. We tried to weave some of those into the conversation uh, as the fire engines go by here. It's normal sound, nothing big. Um, and I want to thank uh, the, the team at NIAC also for making this possible and being the wizards behind the curtain. Uh, 
I'm going to turn back to Hami to close this out for us. And again, thank you all very much, particularly our participants. Hami? Yes, thank you so much, Lala and John, Sonos, Fanny, and Chris. I know our small business community will greatly benefit from your expertise in the conversation today. Uh, please note that we will work with our panel to assemble relevant resources and make them available on our events homepage as well as our video library. Now, before I let you go, I wanted to share with you that NIAG will be hosting its annual gala this year virtually on Thursday, July 30th at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the virtual gala will feature special uh, presentations, musical acts, and uh, remarks from policymakers. Uh, for more information to RSVP and to uh, make a contribution, please visit our events page. Uh, thank you everyone once again for joining us and stay tuned for more programming from NIAC. Thank you.